All right. Well, I have the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm really delighted to see you all here today because we've got a dynamic guest who has written a really, really important book on a vital subject, and we have a lot to talk about. We've been talking about AI since before OpenAI released ChatGPT 3.0 to the world. We've done a whole series of sessions exploring it from every kind of angle, everything from open education, open source software, to faculty support, to how to use the different technologies, to open source, and still more. But what we're doing today is we're really going to zero in on the question of how do you teach with AI in higher education? And our guest for this is a wonderful, wonderful person, a great hero of mine. Jose Bowen is about three or four Renaissance people crammed into one. He's a spectacular jazz musician and a jazz scholar. He's a former college president, a former faculty member. He does something, almost everything. He's written a whole series of books, most famously, you might know, Teaching Naked. And most recently with Eddie Watson, he's co-authored a book called Teaching with AI. And you can find a copy of it. If you look at the bottom left of our screen, you'll see a little tan colored button that says Teaching with AI. Click that and it'll take you to it. But before I bring you up on stage, it's only appropriate to let you know that I did a little bit more research today in order to prepare for him. Now, appropriately, what I did was I went to several different AI programs and asked them, how best could I interview Jose? And it wasn't just for me. I mean, I want to think of all the questions all of you could ask. You know, I went through a bunch of these. I went through Gemini, I went through ChatGPT, but none of them were quite as good as Perplexity. And Perplexity came up with this really interesting set. Notice that, first of all, it gave a series of sources that are pretty good, including interviews with Jose. Uh, it asked about, or it wants me to ask about practical applications. How can AI enhance interactive teaching, learning techniques, and assessment strategies, for example? And then it also asked for implementation and best practices. Uh, a whole series of questions here, everything from how can educators address concerns about academic integrity, to how can critical thinking skills and information literacy be fostered, to what are some of the practical suggestions for integrating AI effectively? I hope these are fun questions for you to think about. Um, keep these in mind as we bring Jose up on stage. Good afternoon, sir. Hi, glad to be here. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, how is everything down there? Are you boiling to death yet? What's the weather like? Oh, we've had a wet year, but we're 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 hot and humid today. You're in uh, the Dallas area, right? I am. Lots of air. Oh. Oh, yes, that's that's vital. I understand. I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C. area. I know how that works. Um, Jose, there, there's all kinds of ways that all kinds of questions I can ask you, but I want to start off with a simple and future oriented one first. What are you going to be working on for the next year? What is the next what do the next 12 months have in store for you? Uh, more AI, I think. I mean, this this project started about a year ago. Uh, where, you know, like everybody else, I was looking at AI and thinking, well, this is this is interesting. What's going to change? And um, I realized if, if we were going to write a book, we had to do it quickly. And and being mostly retired, I was able to say, OK, I'm going to do nothing else but AI for six months, mm. a year. Mm. Um, but I do think that that AI is going to change um, not just lots of things about work in our life. I do think it's like the internet or a calculator. I, I think it's going to have ramifications lots of places. And so um, most of what I'm doing is is traveling around the country, helping people to think about AI in a different way and maybe also give them a couple mm. of tips for how to implement it in class. Interesting. Interesting. That sounds like a, quite a retirement, uh, a very, very busy and productive retirement. Um, you're, the, the book you, you co-authored with Eddie Watson, again, I'm sorry, friends, uh, Eddie couldn't make it because of a schedule conflict, but I want to make sure that we express our gratitude for, uh, for uh, his work on this. Uh, you conclude the book with this wonderful paragraph. Uh, All this new thinking will be done with AI. Education, parenting, and democracy have always managed an uneasy tension between what to think and how to think. As the internet provided more immediate access to content, it profoundly shifted that balance to process. Our new future is teaching students how to think with AI. And I, I, I love this because this is a, a fantastic thesis statement that just lights up the whole book. And I, I've got to ask, well, in fact, here, let me actually just fix the, the, uh, the screen a little bit so it looks a little more, a little more conversational. 
what are what are some of the ways that you would like people to think about AI in ed higher education that they're not already doing? Well, I think the you know, I so let me start with I'm not for or against AI, and I don't think most of us should be either, right? It, it's it's like being for or against the internet. You know, we, we didn't know uh, 20 years ago what all the ramifications were going to be, but I, I I should have kept that 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 memo that said don't use Google, email is never you know don't use etc. Um, mm. You know, it's a part of our lives now for better or for worse, and a lot of it is for worse. But I'm not sure that we would have known how social media was going to change the world in so many negative ways 20 years ago. So, so for me, it's not about being for or against. It's about what are the ramifications for the future. And so the big ones, I mean, obviously, it's going to change work. Uh, but it's also going to change average. I think it already has. So the fact that that white, it's not the best writer, but it's better than many of our students. Uh, right, it's a C maybe, uh, but it means that that work that's AI level work is being devalued in the workplace because an AI will do it. So if a student graduates only able to do AI level work, they're mm. going to have a harder mm. time getting a job. Uh, mm. I think mm. AI is mm. going to change communication, right? AI is already more persuasive than humans. It's a better listener than humans. It mimics and responds, right? This is mm. really not a great thing uh, all the time. Uh, and it's going to change creativity. And people often say, well, how, you know, it's not creative. It's just, you know, possible. But yeah, but it is, it is going to change creativity. Um, and there are really two arguments we make in the book. Um, one is that, right, it's, a, it's quantity. Right. The humans, right, if you want more ideas, uh, if you want better ideas, you need more ideas um, and ideas are combinations of things. And so we often get stuck. It's a great way to get unstuck. Uh, and so if I need 10 new ways to introduce this topic to class, I, I can only do five. The AI can do another 10 or 50. And so it's a great collaborator on creativity. But the other thing about creativity and AI is that right, humans are inhibited. Right. So there are things that I don't want to say today because I don't want to offend anybody. And right. And if and if you if you don't think this is true, then just go to a faculty meeting. Right. There, <laughs> there are all sorts of things you're not going to say because you can see, you know, over there in the corner. And yeah, say, we did that. Yeah. Right. So, so you just stay quiet. And AI doesn't do that. This is also the source of hallucinations, which is a problem. But right. What do you call a human who hallucinates an artist? Right. So, mm. so in some circumstances, hallucinations, not being inhibited, saying whatever you know comes to mind can be a useful thing. And so the problem is that AI is an interest is a weird technology. And but like all technology, it comes with things that will be good and things that will be bad. And so our challenge is how do we adjust to this new world um, and help our students be prepared for this? Mm, 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 mm. That's a fantastic opening. Um, Friends, if, if you're new to the forum, I'm going to ask uh, Jose another question, maybe two, but then it's going to be over to all of you. So again, uh, as Jose responds and as he talks about his book and as you get a chance to check it out online, please think about the questions you'd like to ask. Uh, you're all welcome to ask. And again, if you'd like to join us on stage, click the raised hand button. Uh, if you want to type in a Q&A box, already, uh, you know, just click the uh, question box. Already people have started <laughs> entering that, which is great. Um, there's a... Uh, I guess one question I, I, I'd like to start with then uh, is how can a, a faculty member who doesn't have a lot of support start teaching with AI? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about a faculty member who might be an adjunct, a faculty member who might not have access to a teaching and learning center, uh, a faculty member at a university or college, which like most of them has no strategic direction about AI, no top, you know, no policy coming from the top. And this is a faculty member who is really busy, you know, already has a, a you know, lots of teaching, research, service needs. What, where can they start and, and how? Uh, so it's interesting because the, the, this is an area where uh, the strategy is, is needs to be bottom up anyway. Uh, so your university not having a strategy, et cetera, is actually not a problem because this is not an IT issue, right? Most of the use of, of that's changing in the workplace that uses AI is non-technical. Um, so the first thing I'd suggest is that um, you have to get to use AI, 
right? You know, Ethan Mollick says you need 10 hours and three sleepless nights, uh, you know? Uh, and so I've put in the, in the chat, um, I have a link on my website that has all of the prompts from the book, but it also has links to a bunch, right? The big three AI and then lots of other tools. Um, but then also lots of prompts. So my suggestion is that the first thing everybody should do is, you know, open up all three of the of the big AIs. Um, you, you, you do get much better results when you pay for the, the better versions, although at the moment, ChatGPT4 Omni uh, is free and Claude 3 Sonnet's pretty good. So, uh, but my suggestion is that, right, if you, you have to ask a better question. So I've put lots of prompts there customize the prompt, right? The more detail, right? I need 15 ways to introduce specific topic to my students, specific students at this college in this month, it's basketball season, it's whatever, right? The more of that, give me 15 ideas for a way to do that. And so some some opportunity, some playing around with, with AI is essential. Uh, maybe you don't need 10 hours on each tool, but maybe you do. Um, but in fact, most of the innovation is not coming from institutions saying, here is what we're all going to do. It comes from people who say, oh, I tried this and that worked. I, I talked to a guy yesterday uh, who was, you know, creating a, a, a TA, right, an AI TA for his courses mm -hmm. using his LMS. Um, and mm -hmm. I said, so the big thing, he's open source. I said, you've got to get, every, right, don't make everybody else reinvent the wheel. Share this tool, you know. Um, you know, for grading, for example. Now this, if you're at a small liberal arts college and you have 20 students and your grading is really personal, then of course you mm -hmm. should do that. But if you're an adjunct and you have 600 students and you're you know, dying under a mountain of papers, then it's probably worth your while to teach an AI how to grade in your voice and give students feedback because that will change your life and give you, right? So it's gonna depend and I would argue that actually the ethics also depends, right? Because again, I think that there's a big difference between what someone at a small private college can do versus someone who's an adjunct with 600 students can and might think about doing for students. So in my view, if you've got 600 students and you're an adjunct and you don't have time to talk to students because you're always grading, allowing the chat, the, the AI to do some grading for you so you can have more conversations with your students we have more time for relationships is probably a better thing. But what I see is that everybody wants a chat bot or we're going to automate this and students are going to talk to chat bots. And I don't think that's the best thing for institutions to do um, because that's already shown to increase loneliness. They're already on their phone all the time. Uh, what students really need is more face to face human conversations. So I'd rather not see a proliferation of chat bots. But if that means that some grading of essays or problem sets is uh, from AI, then I think that's a reasonable trade-off. But but my point is that it really depends on the circumstances of the individual person. That, okay, so first of all, everybody else can go now. That was a complete lesson right there. That was a, a complete breakdown. Uh, and, and, and there's so much there to unpack everything from uh, you know, not, I mean, focusing the technology to be used to free us up for more relationship and interaction. Uh, so first of all, thank you. That's a, that's a fantastic answer. Jose, I was going to ask a couple more questions, but the queue is already formed up. Uh, and there's a great deal uh, of, of questions there. And, and friends in the chat, by the way, um, uh, it looks like the chat is already filling up with good, uh, good notes and good ideas. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, I'll save the chat and uh, down the road, post it in my blog. I'll anonymize your names. Um, just let me know if you have any questions about that uh, in, in the chat. Yeah, I can start um, with, the, with the with the FERPA and security question if you want. Uh, uh, since every, really? that's, a, that's everybody. So so two things. Um, first is right. Very little in your life is no risk, right? Um, you get in a car, and of course, your car company owns all the conversations you have in your car on your phone with work, et cetera, anyway, right? And they also know when you're speeding in a school zone, and right, some of them, like GM, are selling it to uh, insurance companies, right? Um, every time you do a Google search, they remember, right? So um, all of this hinges on how much you trust big corporations. So in theory, you can go to Google and say, don't save my data. Uh, you can go to chat GPT and say, don't use my data for training. Um, and if you trust them, then, you know, you're, you're probably in terms of, you know, are you sharing student data? I would certainly not share student names, but if I share student essays, 
right? AI doesn't know anything, right? It, it, it just has weights, right? It has, it has predictions, which mm -hmm. is why mm -hmm. if you ask an AI for a random number between zero and 100, you are more likely to get 42 than any other number. Right. Why? Because of the Hitchhiker's Guide. Right. So, I, I mean, in. so so that, that's just that, that's a kind of bias that it gets from just where it gets its sources. So but they don't want you pissing in the well. Right. They don't want you to be able to say, oh, 42, 42, 42. Right. And to be able to try. They've already got things in their models. So um, there's low incentive for them to steal your data and there's high incentive Ooh. for them to protect it, because if there's a security breach at chat GPT, right, the stock price is going to. Right. So they have hmm. a high incentive. Hmm. Plus, they will sell you FERPA compliance. It's expensive for universities, though. So what I've seen so far is a couple of universities have bought their own right license for everybody, right? But co-pilot at thirty dollars per person per month seems a crazy deal. Um, there are people who are using their own cloud space that are right, um, but. And you could download uh, an open source app to your right. You could go to you know Hugging Face and download mm -hmm. download. You know Llama is really good, and then you can build a grader in your voice on your laptop, and then nobody ever has to see any papers. It's a little more work, but note it's not security free, risk free either, right? That now if you lose your laptop, right, it's on your right. There's still right. You've transferred the security from them to you. So there are real issues, but we know that university lawyers tend to be overly cautious. So I think the risks are lower than people think they are. And I think there are ways to mitigate those risks and universities are moving to do that. Um, but I, I think that depending on your circumstances, uh, if, like, if your university already has co-pilot built in, you know, talk to your people, but you should, yeah. you should be using an enterprise system. You should be okay with student data there um, if, if your university is already a Microsoft campus, if they've paid for that license. So that's a, that's a good question. It's, we should be asking the ethical questions, but I don't, I do think that the privacy security questions are, are relatively lower than we think they are certainly compared to other kinds of things that we do with our phone and in our life. Well, that's a great answer. And, and by the way, friends, you could see that Jose has experience both as a faculty member as an advanced technology user, but also as a president. So he's able to go from the classroom to the enterprise smoothly and easily. Um, th there's, a, there's a raft of questions in the, in the Q&A box that I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up, now, Jose. And, and I'll start with a, a really quick one, because uh, it's a good practical one. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, what did you have to do in perplexity for it to know all the details of Mr. Bone to be able to ask good questions? Um, Professor Duda, all I asked was this question, I'll put it in the chat which was, what questions should I ask Jose Bowen about teaching with AI? Uh, and perplexity, uh, its bias is to go out into the web and find sources right away. So I, I asked the, the simplest question, and uh, compared to the other tools, compared to Gemini, compared to uh, ChatGPT, it was it, it found the most. So that's that's a that's a, a really quick question. Uh, but I want to I would bring up some more questions uh, too that are that are even richer. Uh, this is our friend Gabriella Weaver. Uh, and she asks, I have your book and attended a recent talk by you and Ed Watson, but AI capability and options are changing so quickly. What is the best way to stay current and not become overwhelmed? Thank you, Professor Weaver. Good question. So, yeah. So I, I don't I don't know if anybody can stay current. I can't stay current, you know, and I read three or four sub stacks a day. Uh, just trying to keep up. I did read that, you know, 75 page paper on learn LM from Google on the airplane. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm trying to do that for people. But the, what we did in the book, what we knew the book would be out of date quickly. So we didn't talk as much about individual tools and more about principles, right? Um, so, you know, I mentioned, you know, AI is going to change average. Well, that means that grading and policies, right? That so, so you're going to need a policy. I think you should be talking to students. You should be demonstrating the problems of AI. But then also, right? The data on work continues to say students are going to need it for work. Um, Eddie tells a story about a, he met a, a student at a who was going to had a full time job as a business writer, and then was taking a night course at a community college in business writing. And her boss at work said, you've got to start using AI more because you're slower than everybody else. I need you to be faster and your work will improve too. And then she would go to her class. Wow. The professor said, it's forbidden for you to use AI. And she's like, well, I'm confused, <laughs> right? Yeah. Wow. So, so what's happening in business is changing, right? We also, you know, the, the roofer 
uh, came and, and, and said, oh, you'll have a quote in two minutes because right, he's holding his phone up the whole time. And the, the, right. So the roofing hasn't changed of his job, but the AI that can do the quote is now making right. And for musicians, right, for artists, I don't like marketing. I want to play the piano, but I can have AI, you know, write copy or do it. So it's figuring out what AI, you know, can and should be doing to make your life easier. But that's that transition is happening in the workplace. So, uh, you know, you know, read the headlines every once in a while. I do look at things. You know, read a you know, uh, uh, I read Brian's Substack. You know, there's there are places to find Ethan Mollick's Substack is probably one of the best. Um, yeah. But there there are, there are yeah. a bunch of them. Um, but I I would worry less about staying current, and more about um, am I in the game? Which is, do I use AI? Am I trying various tools? Uh, am I am I talking to my students about how they're using AI? Um, I think you could go crazy trying to stay current. We're, we're in the Alta Vista Ask Jeeves phase, yeah. right? Yeah. If you don't yet yeah. know what's going to emerge as the dominant tool, I will say that if you've only used a free version until recently, right, you're using a modem and you really don't know what the internet's going to do. Uh, you need to use a better version. But if you're using for Omni, chat GPT for Omni that just came out two weeks ago, you should try that on your phone with the microphone, try to talk to it, right? That is another big game changer. Yes. The visual, the right, you can, you can now have it watch you do, you know, math problems, et cetera. Um, that's definitely worth your attention. Absolutely. Well, Thank you. That's a great, great response. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Weaver, for the really, really good question. Uh, I think this is, I think, uh, Jose, I think your response is one that people uh, all over are going to be uh, uh, responding to. Um, we have we have more questions coming in, and uh, I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance. Uh, here's one from uh, our friend Brad Wheeler in Indiana, who we have hosted as a guest on the Future Trends Forum before, one of the great thinkers about uh, education technology. And he asks this. The last two decades have slowly helped faculty rethink and choose what treasured pedagogical habits should be left behind. What should faculty be leaving behind as we teach in an AI-enabled world? Oh, good one. Good that question. That is a really, really good one. Um, so, you know, I'm inspired a little bit by Leon Furs and this idea that writing, but that we, we often assign writing as, a, as a, an assessment tool, right? You, turn in this thing and there it is and i'm going to grade it as as a measure of your content you know the the final essay um but now that ai can write a c essay easily you know writing is about process writing is about thinking and so instead of grading the final product and saying well this is what you have to write you're i don't care that you're a scientist or an engineer i'm going to value you by how well you produce sentences um Maybe we need to go back to AI to, to writing as mostly about process. Um, so um, I, I think there are a couple of things that I think AI can make us do better. I have to think about what we should mm -hmm. totally stop doing. I mean, because I've been saying, you know, the lecture is 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 you know we should do more active learning, et cetera, for a long time. We've all of us. Have yeah. been saying that. Um, yeah. I also think that we should write. We know that people pay attention more when they see their own name in a problem set, right? This is somebody who never saw Jose in a problem set growing up as a kid. It was always mm -hmm. Stephen and Nancy are, are dividing apples and oranges. They were never going to guavas or figs or et cetera. So, but, so I ask students to do a pre-course survey. You know, what's your favorite sports team? What music do you like? Um, where are you from, et cetera? Uh, and then mm -hmm. I export that as a spreadsheet. And then I can upload that into an AI with my assignment and say, I would like you to create customized assignments for every, a customized version of this assignment, put the student's name at the top, right? So, because we know that nobody cares about train A and train B leaving the station at 20 and 30 miles an hour, right? That, that just nobody, that it's not motivating. But if I say, you're covering a wide receiver who runs 30 miles an hour and you only run 20 miles an hour, how, right? It's the same math problem, but students we know will do more of them because it seems like it's relevant or the Republicans mm. are registering 30 voters an hour and the Democrats are only registering 20 voters an hour. How much earlier are the Democrats, right? It's the same math problem, but students are much more engaged. They're much more likely to, to do it. So now I can do with AI, I can customize things 
uh, to a much greater level, right? So your favorite singer shows up and your favorite, you know, sports mm. team. So um, AI is going to allow customization. AI is going to allow much more feedback, right? I don't have to say, well, I'll read your essay at the end of the semester. Three weeks later, you'll get some feedback. Um, I remind people that the best teacher in the world is not a coach. It's the tennis net, right? You could mm -hmm. learn tennis without a teacher, but you cannot learn tennis without a net because mm -hmm. the net gives immediate mm -hmm. feedback that's that's honest right it's objective it's it's, it's trustworthy uh, and it's, mm -hmm. it's it's also actionable so you know if we can use ai to give that kind of feedback we can radically improve teaching um so uh, you know, i think i think now is we have to rethink our rubrics right what's the c we have to rethink policy do we want ai what are we trying to help students do last thing i do notice note that Right, the prompt engineering thing, right? I mean, it is about asking better questions as AI gets better. Basically, AI is learning how to cook, right? Uh, Google LM, right? If I ask a regular AI how to do something, I have to give it a recipe. I have to give it all of the details, right? To get a better answer. But they've taught L learn LM how to cook. So I can just say, boil an egg and it knows how to do it, right? It's, it's taught it how to be a teacher. Don't give the answer limit you know think about cognitive load right they've given it all of the sort of pedagogy that most of us didn't have um <laughs> so so that could be a better teacher so uh, i i think they're we're at this weird moment where there's both maximum fear and maximum potential um and mm, i'm not yeah. sure which way it's gonna go <laughs> well well I'll say thank you for that for that great answer, uh, Brad. Uh, that's a fantastic question. Just one note in the in the chat. There's a, a discussion about uh, should we give up high stakes testing um, as uh, as a result of AI. So I'm I'm not going to comment on that. I just want to make sure that we that we see that. Um, I mean, the truth is, high stakes testing is right. We all perform less well when there's you know one high stakes test. We, you know, we all learn more. When, that's the, again, the tennis net is lots of little right. It comes in little chunks. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's probably the case that we are going to need, you know, some sort of blue book, proc, you know, some sort of, you know, there are going to need to be some response. You know, I hope that the medical boards don't let people, you know, take that online with it, whatever. Right. I do hope that. Uh, so I, and I think when students know there are some things you have to know or be able to do. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So that's that's a, another another good one another good one uh and part of that comes from uh, jordan davis at georgetown university just a shout out to george uh, to georgetown and to jordan um now friends though we've had examples of uh, chat questions and of course the q a box questions now let me bring up on stage uh, another questioner this is our good friend brent anders with the american university of armenia uh, author a uh, researcher into uh, ai and teaching and a huge, huge advocate for AI literacy, which is also a theme in, uh, in Jose's book. So let me bring him up on stage. And uh, good evening, Brent. Hello, hello. Uh, it's great to talk to you, Jose. This is uh, this is very interesting. And again, this is the field that I'm very much interested in. So, and uh, plus, I love your reference to Ask Jeeves. That, that's a good uh, uh, blast from the past. Um, but what I want to talk about, and I'm glad that you mentioned about the importance of testing it out with your cell phone, right? Because a majority of our students, that's all they use. Right. I mean, I have some students that they'll, they'll write out their paper on their cell phone. So that, that's, that's something that we have to, to understand. And it's a whole different dynamic when you're using your cell phone and you're talking into it. And that leads to my question here. So there has been a, a dramatic shift in the capabilities of AI with the release of GPT-40. Um, I say dramatic because it is dramatic as far as its capability right now that we can use. And then in a few weeks, it's going to be even more powerful once it has the full visual capabilities, the full multimodality with it being able to, to visually see you live while you're working with it. Um, it's a whole different dynamic. It's going to change things. And that's my question to you is if you started to to think about that aspect because that's something I'm starting to look into as far as this relationship building that I think is going to really start to occur because now I can have this AI that isn't just a simple tool that I can ask it questions and it gives me data, but now it's going to become somewhat of a friend, somewhat like a relationship with a real human tutor where 
a good tutor is enthusiastic. A good tutor tries to motivate you and is interested in what you're having to say. And from those demos that uh, GPT showed, it's, it's really going to be like that. And, and I'm wondering about this relationship, this real, not physical, but this real humanistic relationship that we are going to start to develop with AIs. If you had any comments on that. Oh yeah, but sure, no one's gonna like them. But I mean, so <laughs> I mean, there's 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 clearly good and bad here. So I do mm -hmm. think that right, Apple is a, Apple is gonna come out with some right when it, when this when Siri and Alexa are this smart and this intelligent, right? If you haven't experienced the emotional intelligence that's now coming, you know, you, you really need to do that. The the I like I like the video about the guy who wants the interview, puts on the hat, and she laughs, and yeah, you know, uh, from OpenAI. So. I think Learn LM is already the better teacher because, again, the, Google taught it pedagogy. They gave it a pedagogical frame and then they had it tested with real students and faculty, humans at Arizona State. Um, so first is that, right, it's going to be easy to have a relationship with these things, which is why the AI has been so slow to do this and been so careful because, right, they don't want to become porn sites. Right. Because, of course, the first thing people are going to do is talk dirty to me. Right. They're going to. Yeah. And so they're worried about that because that will overwhelm all of this. And we've got that lawsuit with Replica about, you know, the, the, they took out the, the that feature. And so I, I think that, right, that when we already have this problem around the world with, you know, and with people on their phones and developing relationships. So I think um, that's a, a general worry for society. Um, for educators, though, if it remembers me, and is right if we have the right safeguards in place there is potential here there's a study about um getting a call from the veterinarian about your pet dying and even when people are told that it's an ai they're talking to they like it better because the ai is more empathetic it knows it remembers mm -hmm. well, three years ago when we saw smitty and he, right it, re, it it has more mm -hmm. details because the vet is like i don't remember the last i saw your dog three years ago right it's so as nice as that is which is a really weird finding um but but it's backed up by another dozen studies that ai is going to help us be better you know if i got a flash on the screen right now that said people are nodding off shut up Do, you know i would you know because ai is a better listener um, mm -hmm. So I worry a lot about this because I think that human relationships in this generation are an issue. Again, being a college president, right? The, the, my daughter needs to change roommates, but she won't. Can we just take her out in the middle of the night without having anybody know? And it's like, I, I said, you, you have to tell. I, you, they finally wore me down with lawyers. And I said, OK, your daughter can change roommates on one condition. She has to tell her roommate face to face that she wants to change rooms. That that child stayed okay. in that room until graduation, right? So wow. the one thing she couldn't do. So I worry wow. about that, um, but I do think that the multimodal capabilities um, that we are we are going to have a friend on our phone, and students are going to be more comfortable with this than we are. And I think that transition could happen much more quickly uh, than we think, because again, students will start doing this. They're going to ask for help. And we've also got examples like Jill Watson at, at Georgia mm -hmm. Tech, um, mm -hmm. where we have chat bots that are reliable, that are built into courseware. Uh, I do think that Blackboard and Canvas and all the LMS will roll out uh, their their AI, some version of it. You know, we'll see who gets there first. But right, if they use For Omni, if that gets built into your LMS and students are getting reliable help 24-7 on how to do the homework, um, that's a real game changer and so the struggle then is how do we create the relationships how do we get students to come in and see us face to face right which is already a problem um but back to the question about what do we stop doing i think the biggest issue facing higher ed is what i call the new training paradox which hmm. is that internships are going away because ai can do the junior work right it, it can't right the senior doctor and and pr person and lawyer is still better but the draft of the press release for cvs i don't need a bunch of re recently graduated college students to do that i can have and so we're already seeing those people are being let go and ai is being used to replace them my corporate contacts tell me that the the new form on hr is why do you need a person you want to hire a person prove to me you need a person mm -hmm. uh, which wow. makes Right in the corporate side, for if you're just saving money, that makes sense. So, 
but they're going to want to hire experts because experts are still better, right? You've got to know something. So how do we train students to be senior lawyers if they can't be junior lawyers and interns first? Well, right. the one idea I have is that maybe we stop with the courses in college and turn college into a giant internship, right? Because the mm. What students really need is experience and expertise. So maybe it's a four-year internship with a few courses, but most of that content could be delivered more effectively through your AI tutor, as you suggest. But then the human interactions, the actual practical, that maybe we need to design. So college becomes more like an internship because those internships are going away. But that paradox of how do I, how do I train you to be an expert, an expert writer? Right now, all writing is editing. Right. If AI writes the draft, I need to be able to recognize good writing versus bad writing, right? Or good nurses' notes. I work with a nursing school. It's like, well, the AI writes better nurses' notes. Okay. Yeah. But the yeah. AI could produce good and bad nurses' notes, and they have to tell the difference because that's the skill they're actually going to need. But mm. that's a different skill than writing. And so I think that's, you know, I don't have the answer, but that's the paradox I think we're now headed toward at light speed. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. And the thing is, like, one of the big things I'm looking forward to, because the class I teach, professional communications, it's it's all about experience, right? I give them chances to experience things. Like, they have to actually go do an interview. They have to go do a job interview with me. But my my big hope here is that I can use the AI for them to go through a simulation first, so that they gain experience to then gain experience from me to then be really ready for the real outside world. So. Yeah, a combination of all of that. Yeah. And we've been doing that with, right, you know, firefighters learn to tr train in simulations, right? Police, right? We, we want you know, drivers, right? we want people to learn first in, right? Don't get into the 747 and see what happens. No, we don't want, right? We want you to try simulations first. And so AI simulate, right? I, I tell students before you go to that interview for your, you know, at Microsoft, practice before you go to your interview at the University of X. Practice with the search committee. Tell the AI what your search committee is and practice your interview. That's a great yeah. way to practice and you'll be better at the interview. So why would you not do that? Um, so I, I do think that the simulation capability is another one that's, that's going to be a game changer. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brent. Uh, thank and you. please, Brent, if you haven't already, put your uh, put your channel in, in, the, in the chat box so uh, people can subscribe to it because it's okay. excellent. Um, and uh, that's an example of a video question, friends. So and you can tell clearly from Brent that you don't have to have a beard in order to be on video on our program. So um, please uh, you know, hit the raised hand if you'd like to join us with a question. And thank you again, Jose, for that uh, terrific answer. Um, we have a, a, a really thoughtful question uh, coming from uh, an Arsinus College professor, Meredith Goldsmith. And this is, this is a, a deep one that I don't think we've touched on so far today. Um, has there been thought or examples yet about using AI and how that could affect how faculty are evaluated? Once we learn to let do what it does well, we can do what we do well, the nature of our work can change. Mm, AI and faculty evaluation, what do you think, Jose? Well, so again, there's the potential for great good and great bad here. Um, mm. But I, I was at the accreditation conference uh, this week in Portland and right, accreditation is one of those things that, that's gonna be transformed. Here are all of the, of the student essays written at our university in the last 10 years. What percentage of freshman essays meet the standard? What percentage of sophomore essays, June, right? Are students getting better at critical thinking over the four years, right? That's a tool that we used to have to sit on committees for. We'd pull out a midterm question and we'd reevaluate it based upon a rubric and then try to convince an, a, an accreditor that we had a general education curriculum that actually made students better at something. Um, Right. So I could say, well, here are all of my course evaluations from the last 10 years. Find this, summarize the key themes and then give me 20 suggestions for how I could transform my syllabus in ways that students would find better and more engaging. Mm -hmm. So it's good at summary, right? AI is really good at summarizing lots of verbal data. So one of the things we do with teaching evaluations the dreaded teaching evaluations is right. We we over numeralize, right? We look at oh well, they got a five, a four point, right? And and once you put a number on it, it must be true because it's a number. But but in fact, most of the interest in the student evaluations is in the student narrative. But of course, just like on an Amazon review, if you read one review, you could have anything. 
But if you've used the AI button on Amazon, right? So summarize all of the reviews. You says, oh, this item runs small for most people or people, right? Whatever, you get a much better sense because it reads all 500 reviews rather than you having to scroll through. So surely there's a way where we could say, so summarize all the teaching reviews this year. What are students most happy about or where? what could this professor most do to improve? based upon a larger body of data than just, you know, some some numbers. Um, it's clearly going to affect research, mm -hmm. uh, right? Now, research, as we know, has sped up, right? We publish a lot more papers. In fact, there are not enough reviewers for the papers we want to publish. Um, but the big breakthroughs are slowing down, right, in a lot of fields. And right, the average age for the Nobel physicist work is going up because there's just so much stuff. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, there's a real danger to just reading summaries of articles from AI. On the other hand, you know, back to the question about how do you keep current? Well, you know, you set up a, a, a thing on consensus or elicit that, you know, some every week in this field, mm -hmm. articles that have mm -hmm. this methodology that, that have a sample size of at least this, you know, whatever, I only, you know, give me a summary of what the new research was in this journal, in this field. Uh, Right. One of my one of my favorite sort of you know nasty questions is I'm going to submit this article to Journal X. Who might the reviewers be, and what uh -huh. what work of theirs should I be sure to cite? Right, because every, everybody yes. likes right everybody likes seeing their own work. So right, AI is a really great tool for that. But I'm afraid that AI will increase the speed of all of us producing research. Um, that's a bad thing. Uh, especially if it's not very good research, right? Could flood. But on the other hand, journals are already using AI to limit. And that actually leads me to, to a, an important point, and then I'll shut up, is that it's true AI has a bias. And it's a problem, and you should pay attention to it. But an AI bias is sometimes easier to correct. So for example, if I'm a journal editor and I say, select articles for the, you know, using the previous articles in the journal, select articles that would be appropriate for the Journal of X it's going to have a bias toward the research that's already been published, and that could be a problem. But if I say, select articles for publication in the Journal of X that challenge pre-existing ideas or challenge other articles that we've written or that are totally new areas, right? You have to actually ask it to explore new areas, but if you ask it to, it does. And if I ask myself, mm -hmm. I would like to select articles for the journal that prove my life's work is meaningless, that's a hard thing for a human to do, right? But it's easy for an AI to do. So, so finding ways that AI can help us overcome human bias is a potential interesting use case. And so for faculty, right, what are all the counter arguments? What are all the things people are going to object to about this research? Mm -hmm that could make our research better. It is going to make cybersecurity better, right? At the moment, AI is a better hacker than most people. But if we mm -hmm. teach all of our students, every time you produce code, see if the AI can break it, right? That could eventually help us students write more secure code um, if we use it as a, as a feedback loop. So, uh, you know, I'd like us to see it make faculty teaching and faculty research better, but it could certainly be used just to quantity, which would be bad. Ah, okay, so first of all, what a great question. What a very, very deep question. Uh, and just as a pointer to the book, by the way, one of the great things is the book goes through the whole ecosystem of the college. I mean, it covers everything from you know, writing grant proposals and reports to the, to the classroom. And Jose, you, you cover a lot of ground in that answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to bring up on stage uh, another uh, one of our dear friends uh, who has a great question. And uh, and this is uh, our friend George Station coming to us from Cal State Monterey Bay. And I think, Jose, you're headed that way or to the Cal State system soon, I think. I am. I'm doing some webinars for Cal State this summer. Monday, I start. You've, you've got to know George because George is fantastic. George, welcome. Hey, Good George. to see you. Hello. Hi. Uh, uh, and thanks for uh, bringing me up here. Um, of course. And, see, I, and um, um, Jose, I will say that I did hear you in person once years ago at a Cal State Summer Institute, uh, and that was some time ago, but, you know, back in the past. Uh, but, um, um, yeah, I've got, like, uh, uh, Brian says I have one question, but I, uh, uh, but it's kind of a setup <laughs> uh, because he also knows 
that I've got several questions. Um, uh, let's start with one about the book, though, itself. I speed listened and skimmed the book, uh, knowing you were going to be on in a couple of days. And um, chapter seven is about policies. And my question about it is, I think that you get into a lot of the concerns that um, I think we in this room might have about um, uh, um, adopting AI or not adopting AI and so on um, in the context of uh, our own individual policies for our classes, but also campus policy, right? Um, and we're all diving in. Some of us, like in uh, my case, my campus doesn't really have a policy. We did a quick one-liner that went into our academic integrity policy, but we don't have like a real AI policy um, um, developed. So uh, my question is, why didn't that come earlier in the book? Because I would probably engaged with the book better had I started with something like chapter seven. So that's a book question, really? I like that. So, but the quick answer is that, uh, and, and we thought of that too, right? Let's start with the practical, but I really do think it, it's not unlike the ethics question, right? Um, it, the ethics questions are important, but you all, right? It's like those people who say, you know, I hate that restaurant. Have you ever been? Oh, I hate that book. Have you ever been? Or I haven't read the book, right? You, you have to actually know how AI works. And so I want it. We, we thought the first thing you have to do is know that the free chat GPT only does this and that this is an API and that you're, how does consensus work and how does AI, you know, how is it, how is it actually creative? Um, what could it do for, right? What are the kinds of things it could do? So I want, you know, I think that play first, or again, the way that children learn how to do everything, right? If you don't hand them a dictionary as a child, right? We, we let them play and they, right? As, as, as Bakhtin said, they, they only hear words in the mouths of others. Right. So so they they learn words in context. Right. You don't learn words out of a dictionary. So I think that play is the first thing. And then when now we can get to the policy conversation, now it's a question of, oh, now that I have a sense of what it can do, I can have a better conversation about policy. But I get that. Right. The first chapter is the one that we're updating first. I, I just finished it today uh, because right, it's the first one to go out of date. But I also thought there was no way around unless you know what LLM stands for or that they're, they're now small models, they weren't in the book, but they'll be in the next edition, right? Because, you know, you have to have some idea of what we're talking about and that they're, that they're different, that Gemini and ChatGPT have different personalities, right? I mean, they don't have real personalities, but they act as if they have personalities and that you need to interact with them as if they were human in order to get the most out of them that's really counterintuitive. And until you've actually experienced that, it's hard for people to understand what they can do. Uh, so, but you're right. I mean, the policy front, but I also, the, and the last thing I'll say is that the, on the policy front, I don't think universities can mandate here is the policy, unless that policy is every student should have access to the very best models and faculty need training in it, and we should support faculty and learning to explore. Um, but this isn't much more individualized, right? It's going to be very different in chemistry than it is in writing. It's going to be different for, uh, for, for, for different kinds of people and different kinds of learners. And so uh, I don't think there's a one size fits all policy because I think industry is changing quickly. And so, so for example, one of my suggestions is every university should write today immediately have an, a senior seminar on AI in the workplace for every student in every major, because it's not right. We often have freshman seminars, but it's, it's going to change. Right. So what I want to do is I want every senior to be wrestling with ethics. What are you going to be asked to do? Right. I often say what we call cheating business calls progress, mm -hmm. but wow. that's changing instantly. And so yeah. the only way to be current is to do it right before they graduate and to say, well, this is actually what you're going to be asked. Uh, one final one. I, I was at a professor at University of New Mexico, and she said uh, two weeks ago, and she said, I did six recommendations for students this week. And all six recommendations from six different companies, the form, every single form said, how does this student use AI to make their work better and faster? Wow. That was two weeks ago. <laughs> wow. So if our students are being asked to use AI when they get to work, we we can't take four years to art, alter our curriculum. So my suggestion is a senior seminar where students actually do this right before they graduate. Um, and they wrestle with the, the ethics issues and they wrestle with the environmental issues and they get prepared for an interview where they're gonna be asked, 
Yeah. Do you use a AI? Because if I said it in an interview, you know, I don't use a spell checker because that's cheating. And so I use a dictionary and my teachers were insistent. And I, I, well, you're going to have a harder time getting hired. Wow. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you for um, all of that. And I feel like um, with my uh, teacher ed students who are mostly seniors, that I feel like I did one thing right last semester, which was actually have them engage with an AI challenge. Uh, it's uh, the one at Plymouth State, uh, uh, actually, that uh, that particular AI, AI challenge, which I want to shout out because it worked <laughs> and um, the students did engage with it. Um, but um, um, I'm wondering uh, um, also, so thank you also about the book update itself. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, that's going to be helpful as well for our summer PD on my campus. Our summer PD is going to uh, 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 kind of revolve around AI, including your text. Uh, so that's just a I uh, didn't know if I uh, needed to mention, was going to mention that or not. Um, and so um, based the issue of bias, though, in ethics that we need to deal with as faculty and as um, staff and as administrators and so on, um, I don't really feel that it's going away or has been really addressed deeply yet in um, any of our conversations um, because we have not just the upfront um, issues so, for example, the uh, way that the original uh, models were um, outsourced with cheap labor and so on, the continuing labor issue because human intervention is still needed. So there's still low cost outsourced labor going on. I think we should care about that as a labor and social justice issue. And I think it needs to be part of our conversations. Um, and waiting for a senior seminar seems too late. Um, I also teach first year students and maybe at the front end uh, we should start talking about this as well we have service learning classes and other classes where this can be addressed so is that something that um i didn't get explicitly that that was part of your approach in your text although you do mention wrestling with it throughout the text it's about teaching with ai as opposed to um, teaching about or you know teaching in spite of ai or some other places we might land in a conversation that really digs into the ethics, um, the uh, uh, biases, not about research, but the old nasty kind of discriminatory biases that are going to make us generate, you know, um, discriminatory images such as, you know, black people as Nazis and so on, which was the really bad example. Right. Uh, so um, how do we how do we tackle that? And I know the time short, but can we get into that a little bit? Well, I, I think I agree with everything you said, right? We, sh we should be, you know, I, people get mad when I say every every assignment is now an AI assignment, every class is now an AI assignment. But yeah, I think it should be infused everywhere. Um, the good news is that right, liberal arts and philosophy and ethics all just became right more motivating for students because it's right, it's, it's, it is it, it is our reality. Um, so, but I'd also say, look, there was there's bias on the on the internet too. Right. And so we should have been teaching that all along too. Right. And right. Google learns, right. G Google doesn't feed you information that you're not going to like. It feeds you. Oh, you're going to like this. You're a Democrat. You're a Republican. I'm going to give you more of these sorts of answers. Right. And so we've seen that already happen. So to me, that sh that should already have been a part of, of a broad education, which is that right as you use the Internet and, you're, and Google learns you, it feeds you things it thinks you're going to like. Um, and so, you know, we have a new one, which is AI bias, but to me, it fits in the same category of, right, skepticism that faculty are good at, right? We are skeptical people. We don't like anything, which is useful, <laughs> actually, but students are not. And so a, lot, a lot of education, right, is about infusing skepticism, right? We always say, it depends hmm. is our answer, right? This is why presidents yeah. got into trouble in front of Congress, because they right. didn't, right? Congressmen don't like it depends as an answer, right? So, so, but it's a good thing for humans. It's a good thing for democracy. And so I think we've got to hold on to the nuance here, which is why I started with, I am not for or against AI. And I don't think any of us can be, we have to hold on to the nuance. There's, there's too many good things that can happen for us to say no. And also like the internet, like a spell checker and like a calculator, there's none of us are going to wish this away. This this is this has already happened. The cat is out of the bag, and it's in your lap. So oh, thank uh, yeah um, um thank you. I dropped my last question in the chat, 
uh, uh, that, that, that is related to hu shrinking humanity's budgets, but you just said don't shrink them is what I heard. And now we're in trouble. And so, you know, what are you going to tell our presidents and provosts and system chancellors and so on about that? Well, have you been one? <laughs> well, the, 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 the workplace cares about two things. We often get, we only get one of them. They want students mm -hmm. who can work in teams, who are critical thinkers, who understand ethics. They want all of that, right? But they also want students who have had some career, some job experience, right? That, that internship. And so, mm -hmm. um, when I was at Goucher, we built right mandatory career services into the curriculum, right? English freshman semester, let's write a cover letter, right? You can't leave this in the career center because most students don't ever go. You've got to. So so that's to me, we could do both. We could both do more humanities and demonstrate the relevance of the humanities toward living a happy, healthy, productive, but also economically feasible life. Those things are not at all. Hmm. Hmm. That's a that's that's a powerful answer. And just just so everyone knows how awesome George is, not only is he on stage, but at the same time having a great conversation, he's continuing this in parallel in the chat box. Um, this this is a a, a, a multitasker guru par excellence. George, it's it's great to see you. Thank yeah, you great, for being here. Great to see you too. Thank thank you, um, Jose. Thank you. Well, uh, friends, we, we are out of time. Uh, we're at the, at the top of the hour again, and, and we're going to have to wrap things up. And I, I, I hate to say that because we have so many questions left. Um, so uh, just, just quickly again in the chat, if you have any, uh, any hesitations about me using uh, your chat or those of you who are put in questions, uh, I'd like to post them as well. Again, anonymize, just please let me know. Um, Jose, as you retire, quote unquote, which is to say, as you crisscross the planet doing research and uh, and 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 playing music, and of course uh, creating this uh, uh, updated version of this book, how how do we keep up with you? What's the what's the best way to find you? Uh, so I'm on LinkedIn, uh, you know, Jose Antonio Bowen. I'm on X a little bit, um, and uh, I you know I have a website. I put the teaching naked uh, dot com with the prompts, you know. But I you know I so I update tools like you know my, my cognitive rappers tool i give away their stuff for free um mm, nice. so uh there's lots of information there excellent excellent well thank you so much for for being with us this has been a, a just a torrent of information and ideas uh i'm, I'm just so glad you were able to join us um and everyone... my previous book is the better book the teaching change book is really about pedagogy and students but of course it was ah. during COVID and nobody cared <laughs> well, um, I'm I, I care a lot that you were able to make it with us. Please, good luck, Jose, and 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 we'll follow up. Thanks. Um, take care. Take care. Thanks, uh, and everybody, thank you for the superb questions. Um, just uh, it's just been a delight uh, keeping up with all of these. Um, I should have a massive blog post on this out uh, as soon as I can. If you'd like to keep talking about these subjects, everywhere from George's question about uh, bias to uh, uh, Brent's questions and everybody else's questions, please just, uh, you can do this on various socials. Just use the hashtag FTTE. You can find me here on Twitter, Mastodon, Threads, Blue Sky, on the blog, and of course on Twitter. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions uh, to build on this, looking into our sessions on AI and other topics, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, if you'd like to look ahead to our other topics, which include AI, but also enrollment, reform and grading, and more of a paradigm conversations, just go to the Future Transform website, forum.futureofeducation.us. And again, thank you all for the questions. This has been a terrific hour plus. I'm really grateful for the chance to think together with all of you about this incredibly important topic. I hope you're all safe and sound in the Northern Hemisphere. I hope you're enjoying the turn into summer, and we'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.